Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. If you feel a great sense of relief this week, almost as if some blockage or obstruction was finally removed, allowing the free flow of materials through an orifice that had been stopped up for way too long, well, that's probably because Intel finally launched 11th gen core CPUs and it was a lot like taking a poo after months of anticipation. Or should that be constipation? Anyway, other tech shit happened this week too, so I hope you've had your tetanus shot. Let's wade in. Excellent. Intel demonstrated to everyone this week that an unhealthy mix of overconfidence, poor product positioning, and, dare I say, hubris, can align just about the entire tech community in universal condemnation of a new CPU launch. 11th Gen Core Rocket Lake S CPUs dropped Tuesday, and at least for the 8 Core 11900K and 11700K, most reviewers dropped them straight into the trash can. Intel's feedback on the launch this week has been brutal, with phrases like embarrassing, pathetic, and worst flagship ever being some of the more forgiving conclusions drawn. Intel could have avoided so much of this by simply pricing these 8-core CPUs competitively against both AMD Ryzen and Intel's own 10th gen parts, which are still very viable, but they seem to have a crippling aversion to lowering prices on their products, probably because some executive sees it as devaluing the brand. Personally, I think having everyone laughing at your launch and it being called a waste of sand, uh, that's still probably the burniest of burns for this round, well played Steve, devalues the brand far more than simply pricing a new 11900K at or below the price of the last gen 10900K, especially when it has 20% fewer cores. Now, if there is a diamond amongst all the roughage, it is the six core options like the 11600K and 11400, which are far more reasonably priced and remain competitive with AMD's offer while also sporting integrated graphics, in all but the F SKUs at least, which is a big selling point right now. That iGPU would be an even bigger selling point too if Intel actually launched drivers for them. First spotted by Adored TV, early adopters of 11th gen core CPUs who actually want to use the graphics will find that there is no official driver currently available for download on Intel's support page. Now, that doesn't mean non-functional graphics entirely fortunately, as there are Intel XE drivers that will install automatically from Windows Update. But that version is months old now, and any PC gamer who has been around the block will tell you that proper driver support can have a significant impact on performance. There was a press driver distributed, although most reviews didn't cover UHD graphics performance. Hardware Lux did, and those results are in the videocards.com article linked in the description. They showed some nice gains over the 10th gen iGPU though, which isn't bad. This just seems like a big miss for a launch of this caliber though, and it's even been confirmed by Intel's graphics software engineering director, Lisa Pierce, public drivers are a few weeks out. And then in a late addition to this little segment, uh, we have an update. And Lisa Pierce, as of Friday, has said that they have drivers flowing to OEMs for a while now. The delay was in public posting with our unified graphics driver flow. They'll work it out ASAP and the driver should be posted by Monday morning. Resizable bar support isn't just a fun euphemism for your boxer briefs. It's also a native feature of the PCI Express protocol that allows the CPU to more efficiently access your GPU's VRAM. AMD realized last year that they could enable that for more performance, which they did for the Radeon 6000 series, and they called it smart access memory, which sounded cooler, and it boosted gaming frame rates by maybe five or 10 or even 15 to 20%, or sometimes 0%. It depends on the game and support. It's something you'd rather turn on than have off though, and now Intel platforms are enabling it too, and unsurprisingly, Nvidia has also enabled it for their 30 series GPUs. It will help out in 17 games as of now, but you might have to take several steps to enable it. Apart from a driver update, you will need to update your motherboard's UEFI to a version that supports resizable bar and update your graphics card's VBIOS, which isn't particularly hard but can be daunting for those who have never tried it. If you regularly play one of these games though and you have compatible hardware, it's probably worth your while to turn on, especially for F1 2020 players who can gain about 12% boost according to Nvidia. They are also not enabling this for some games, hence the required driver support, because with some games, performance can drop with this feature turned on. So well played Nvidia, that's probably the way to go about doing it. Back in January, networking device manufacturer Ubiquity disclosed that unauthorized access to certain information technology systems hosted by a third party cloud provider had taken place. The breach started in December, 2020, and supposedly there was no evidence that user data was accessed, but security researcher Krebs on Security spoke to a whistleblower at Ubiquity who says the breach 
was much worse than Ubiquity let on. Attackers gained administrative access to Ubiquity's servers at Amazon's cloud service, but executives at the company were minimizing the severity to protect their stock price. This is exacerbated by the fact that Ubiquity products, like routers and internet-connected cameras, routinely require cloud-based accounts and logins, meaning there's a good chance that intruders would have the credentials needed to remotely access those devices. More details on the breach are in the article, but if you're affected, the advice is to change your passwords, turn on two-factor authentication, reset two-factor authentication if it's already on, delete any profiles associated with your devices, update your device's firmware, and recreate profiles with new credentials. You can disable remote access too, which is always a good idea if it's not needed. April Fool's Day was Thursday, and although I think the internet has kind of ruined this quasi-holiday day because everyone is reminded that it's happening every time it happens, there's usually one or two items that pop up and amuse me. The winner this year is definitely Captain's Workspace, who posted an amazing video of an NVIDIA RTX 4090. This is obviously not a real product, but he assembled it and it really kind of looks like it could be, although it's absurdly huge. It features dual power plugs so you can bypass your power supply to feed the card's one kilowatt board power needs. It has no less than 12 cooling fans with uh, four on the top and eight on the bottom. And of course it has RGB LEDs on the logo and the NVIDIA logo and the GeForce RTX logo. I was once again blown away by the quality of this model that he assembled for this video and the detail work that he put into it, even including some detail on the PCB and the power delivery setups. Captain's Workspace literally only posts April Fool's videos about technology once a year, so I highly recommend checking out his older videos, such as the RTX 2090 setup that he did in 2019. There it is catching on fire. I personally love the humor, like the soda can that gets pulled across. And then the next shot, it's all torn up in the corner. Uh, it's just it's just awesome. Uh, I have not even shown half of the details from some of these videos. So the link to this video and his channel is down in the description if you want to check out more. And now it's time for tech briefs. Why should tech news be longer when it could be shorter? Chip shortages still plague the industry and chip makers have been announcing plans to build more buildings so they can chip more chips. Ship more chips. TSMC is next up with the hopefully not an April Fool's joke April 1st announcement that they'll be spending 100 billion US dollars over the next three years on their expansion plans. That's way more than Intel's $20 billion investment from last week. The focus is increasing capacity to support the manufacturing and R&D of advanced semiconductor technologies. Sounds good to me, that's what they're good at. Fast internet is good, so why is one of the largest ISPs in the United States trying to tell us that slow internet is all we need? AT&T likes to define broadband in the slowest terms possible so they don't have to invest in infrastructure to provide faster internet, especially in rural areas where service is often the poorest. The US government wants to subsidize a new standard of 100 megabits both ways, upload and download, with fiber to the home, but AT&T wants 50 down and 10 up with as little new building as possible. I'm guessing AT&T is watching out for their bottom line more so than what's in the best interest of their customers in this case. Next up, developments in the field of sustainable electronics research point to chitin, playing a big role in advanced nanocarbon fabrication in the future. Chitin is a biopolymer that seems to be more efficient to manufacture into nanocarbon materials than traditional methods, and it is often derived from crab shells. So in the future, your computer will be made of crabs. That seems pretty straightforward to me. Any questions? Let's move on then. YouTubers are super sensitive, as you probably know, so supposedly, based on creator feedback, YouTube is running a small experiment where they hide the dislike count on videos from public view. We've heard from creators that the public dislike counts can impact their well-being, said YouTube, ignoring the value that viewers get from seeing a high dislike count on, say, a tutorial video that might save you a bunch of time if the video actually sucks. But hey, at least creators will have their feelings spared and have that much less motivation to just create better videos. Finally, I wanted to quickly promote Lewis Rossman's right to repair GoFundMe that he kicked off this week. Lewis shares his electronics repair skills on YouTube and runs a laptop repair store, and he has testified in Congress about right to repair laws. If you think that once you buy something, you should be able to modify or repair it as you see fit, rather than being forced to go through a manufacturer, then consider reading up on the GoFundMe or watching Lewis's video and donating if you can. So there you have it guys, tech news with a side of lockjaw, and you can now navigate the rest of this week knowing that you are informed on all the important things that there are to know. Of course, your feedback is always welcome, so please 
feel free to leave me a comment section down below. There's a lot going on down there, like all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested in further reading. And you can also click the like button. If you enjoyed the video, check out my store at paulshardware.net for a selection of excellent merchandise options, including my new beer sets with the bamboo coasters, and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more videos like this one in the future. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video.